Diane, I am here to ask you about the creator's perspective. Okay. And, um. and, and I know that is not something you usually do. <laughs> so I appreciate your candor with it. And um, I'm just so enthralled with this painting, Cloudy Figures, from your recent um, 2022 exhibition. And um, I have so many thoughts about it, and I, I'm just curious to know some of your thoughts. Okay, well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a, a interesting painting because of the various ways that it can be interpreted. Um, but, you know, to fully understand it, I think it's fair to talk about, you know, my intention and my motivation as when it was created, and then, you know, other people's interpretations are, and the viewer's uh, engagement with it is just as valid. So I think, um, historically, uh, <clears throat> I think I started thinking about this painting early parts of the pandemic. So it went back to around March of 2020 when COVID was first um, rampant and people were, you know, it was so contagious, but yet we really did not know a lot about it. So from that perspective, my motivation was mostly about fear because the information we did have was about people staying away from each other and keeping a distance. And there was all kinds of theories about the way that it was contracted. So, and yet, and yet, that idea of separation is not what humanity is all about. And so it created this kind of this unreal, um, almost surreal world and the uncertainty of the future, I think was really the main idea behind this work. Mm -hmm. So that's, as you can see, there's a lot of figure shapes. They're not clearly defined. There's no facial features. There's no mm -hmm. expression, they're expressionless. And yet, you know, the more you look at it, um, <clears throat> the more you see a variety of sizes and people and, and you know, um, I, I, it's just that feeling about fear and the future. Mm -hmm. um, as, as your first brush strokes started to go onto the canvas, as you have all this other stuff going on in your mind, um, how do you decide on a color palette? I mean, is it something that you think about or something that just intuitively you start using color? And the other thing I, that fascinates me in your work is that your brush strokes on the paintings are so um, silky. You know, they, one goes into the next. At a time when we're seeing so many artists using big chunks of textured color, uh, and it, it's just so different in that regard because it's blended. And I wonder about how you go about, when, when you, you're not looking at the painting as we are here today, all you see is a blank canvas. How do you know, or how do you feel choosing the colors, choosing the shapes, and then uh, choosing the technique that you're going to use? Well, that's a big question. Yes, I and it overlaps a lot of things. Um, but color, uh, it's a human, we have a human response to color. And mm -hmm. of course, being a teacher of color, you learn certain combinations and certain mixtures that you know will evoke a certain response. So on the basic color wheel, there are warm colors and cool colors, and warm colors will advance visually and cool colors will recede. 
but I think what you're speaking about is the blending. Mm -hmm. And so to get that um, softness of overlapping uh, and transparency, oil paints actually work in, to your favor over acrylics because of the slower drying time. Oh. So oil paints in this particular thing was my preferred uh, medium. Mm -hmm. So I think that that softness adds to the uncertainty. In an artist's world, they would talk about form and content. So your content, your subject, your, your direction, what form are you using to get there? So, you know, what colors would work best to go with your subject? to communicate what you, your Which intention. Expression. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> um, the other thing I was wondering about was, when you first started this painting, maybe it took a month or two months or however long it took, maybe a year, were there times where um, you set it aside for a while and came back to it later? Or was this one that you just went from beginning to end, you knew exactly, or you felt exactly? <clears throat> my, in my studio, I always have more than one thing going on. So with oil paints, sometimes you are working what we say wetter. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, there's these kind of drippy marks here. So the drips are diluted oil paint, um, put on at the top of the painting and then let let that, you know, just kind of drip down and then you can see through some of those lines. Mm -hmm. But that's not everywhere. Right. So in this area, it's wet. And while it's so wet, you cannot work on it until it dries. So in that case, you put it aside for 24 hours. When you go back to it, that part is dry and then you can decide mm -hmm. to work in other areas. But I didn't put, it, it It did not take a month. I think it would probably take maybe maybe two and a half weeks to complete this. Okay. So as you first began uh, and you were going through this drying and painting process, uh, was there ever a point where you felt like you had to change direction? Uh, <laughs> or is there a thousand points? Um, like I think... <laughs> People assume that an artist will look at a surface and know how it's going to turn out. I don't know anybody that can do that. No. You begin on a blank surface and you, you listen to it. Mm -hmm. It talks to you. So there are things like a focal point. I would say that that figure up there mm -hmm. is a strongly defined uh, than the others. So I would say that's the focal point. So if I establish that focal point as the most important part of the painting, then everything else has to be secondary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh -huh. it's just like in process. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know how it's gonna turn out. Right. And that's the, the most wonderful thing about painting, and it's also the most frustrating thing about painting because you have infinite possibilities. possibilities. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads into the next question because I, I spoke with you about this piece a long time ago. I can't remember exactly when. And you said um, when I was doing that piece, the figures emerged. You didn't go into it thinking that it was going to be a figurative abstract, but the figures emerged. And so um, just wondering what what you thought of that. How is it related to your your primary intention about the fear and the? Well, you know, a lot of artists at the time kind of stopped. Yeah. They just stopped creating and were unsure about what to do. And I was unsure, but I knew that I just didn't want to sit back and you know be angry and do angry paintings. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people just putting out bold paint, you know, real high contrast work or real urban and gritty kind of 
pieces that were, you know, uh, an out, outbirth of COVID. But I just wanted to, to get more into the human aspect of it mm -hmm. and how people were dealing with it. And it was that uncertainty, you know, we had to, as a teacher, I had to completely take my classes and go online. Mm -hmm. They closed the campus and so on. And, and yet, you know, you don't, that creative part of you doesn't go away just because there's an, you know, this pandemic, you still feel it's your responsibility to react and keep going mm -hmm. and to communicate something. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of thing, I wouldn't do a series of these. I think this is a one of a kind uh, piece that mm -hmm. just reflected my feelings at the time. Well, I just love it. <laughs> and there's a certain breathiness to it when I look at it, you know, and it, it reminds me of that, that, um, you know, uh, just the, the breath itself, the people, people that were struggling were with the struggle, breath. the struggle, uh, the illness itself. Yeah. And I think it does have a healing quality for us that are still looking back and trying to make sense of it all. Right. So. Thanks. So maybe um, maybe a, a, a conclusion could be that humanity and hope together. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.